Hi guys, I'm uh, John uh, Schwartz, that's like uh, the last one. This is Anne Tarday, she works at uh, Mirantis, Kevin Benton also works at uh, Mirantis, I work at uh, Red Hat, uh, it's a small company, you don't know it. Uh, today we're going to talk about the race conditions of uh, Neutron's uh, L3 HA um, solution, uh, specific, specifically the scheduler, under scale performance. So that's like a lot of subject to uh, get through in 45 minutes, please bear with me. Um, so the talking points are quite uh, unusual, um, un-unusual. Uh, we're going to cover some HA routers 101, uh, what are HA routers, um, uh, what kind of resources do we need in order to represent um, an HA router, both uh, physically uh, namespaces devices, uh, and uh, more specifically uh, database structures um, on the um, uh, server side. Uh, then we're going to continue on to some race conditions that we have encountered uh, in Neutron. Uh, continue on to scale testing that Anne did on uh, both Liberty and Mitaka and finish up with some uh, future work. Uh, <coughs> so what does it mean to even schedule a uh, layer 3 router? So basically scheduling means binding uh, resource, so in our case it's a router, uh, to one of the network nodes that we have. So in this example we have three network nodes or more and we have created a router and now we've gotten uh, an API request to add a router interface, uh, connect our router to some um, internal um, tenant uh, subnet. Uh, so this requires an actual binding, an actual representation somewhere on the network nodes uh, to let everyone know, hey, this is the route in which the package should flow. So binding a router is basically um, scheduling it and letting, him, uh, letting everyone know this is where it's at. So once we have the um, request to add a router interface which triggers a scheduling, the scheduler has some kind of an algorithm, either um, the least used network node or the least used um, L3 agent should pick this up or a random choice among all the um, valid network nodes. So in this case, um, the uh, scheduler decided to assign, uh, to bind uh, the router to the second network node. So that's basically the scheduler and that's what it's uh, supposed to do. On the legacy router, that is the non-HA cases of non-HA legacy or DVR non-HA, uh, it's a simple case because we have one router, we need to choose one agent among all uh, the possible possibilities, the possible network nodes, and we just choose it and create the bindings. And uh, once it is created, um, the server lets the network know, the L3 agent know, hey, this is a new router, please uh, handle it. On the layer 3 HA case, it's a bit more complicated because we need to choose a bunch of uh, network nodes that will handle it. So in this case, we have the, the node 3, node 4 and node 5 are all um, uh, network nodes, and um, the router is scheduled to all these nodes, and it is active only on the uh, node 4 um, network node. What does it mean that it's active? It's active as in all the data flows through it and the standby nodes or the passive nodes are just waiting until node 4 will fail or will crash or something will happen to it. Um, and then they can fail over and take over the responsibility. This algorithm of who should be the active one, who should be the passive one is handled solely by Keep Alive D. Uh, and KeepAlive D uses a VRRP protocol. It's a non-open stack project. You can uh, look it up. It's probably open source. Um, um, and the KeepAlive D, they all sit inside HA networks that are unique per tenant, which basically means that if I have tenant A, tenant A has two routers. Uh, tenant A will have um, a separate HA network than tenant B, which is the red one. So. This is apparent here, we have the blue HA network and the red HA network, and all the connectivity that goes between uh, Keep Alive D that are in different HA networks uh, goes through that HA network. So basically, we have a Keep Alive D for each agent, for each router. So if we have router one here, and it's also in L, the layer three agent number two, it will both have Keep Alive D. Um, the Keep Alive D uses uh, different VRIDs per, um, per router, so they won't collide. So if we have Keep Alive D that is serving router one, it won't think uh, that something happened to router one or the other network node in case router two fails 
uh, for some reason. So the separation is both of uh, HA networks, okay, for different tenants and for different VRIDs. So that's basically all you need to know here. Uh, on the database layer, this requires a lot more resources. So the first resource is the router L3 agent binding. It is a one-to-one -one matching between a router and an agent. So this basically means this is the router, this is the agent, it is assigned to it. On the non-HA case, we have a single uh, binding as such. On the HA, we have one for each agent the, um, the router is scheduled to. On top of that, we said we have a keep alive uh, D that um, is used by the HA routers and they see it in HA networks and the, HA net and the Keep Alive D uses different VRIDs. So all of these require uh, database resources. So we have the L3 HA router VRID allocation, which basically means this is the VRID for this router. Um, we also have the L3 HA router network, uh, which, which comes in addition to the normal network we all uh, know and love in the uh, Neutron database. Um, and this one holds the HA ports, right? Because each Keep Alive D sits on an agent and it needs to be connected to some HA network. So we use, um, I forgot what I was about to say. So we use HA ports to connect, an actual port that connects the Keep Alive D to the HA network. Um, next up, we have the L3 HA router agent port binding. That's a really long name, which basically represents a triplet of a router, an agent, and an HA port. This is the router. It sits on this agent, and this is the port that connects the Keep Alive D on that agent uh, to the HA network. Um, when creating an HA router, uh, this is roughly the pseudocode. We create the router database object, uh, as usual, and then uh, next up is creating the HA network if one doesn't exist. If one exists, we don't need to create another one. Um, <coughs> sorry. Um, after we have created the uh, HA network, uh, we create some unbound HA interfaces. We create unbound L3 HA router agent port binding, uh, one per expected agent. So we create the bindings, we create the ports, we just don't assign the ports and the bindings to an actual agent that comes later on. Don't ask me why it's uh, that way. Uh, we couldn't figure it out. Uh, next up, we create the VRIDs, uh, one per each router, uh, and then the scheduling comes along. We determine which, which agents will host the router. There's an, a real long uh, algorithm that does it. It's like five lines of code. Um, we assign the HA interfaces to agents. So now we know which agents will get um, the bindings. So we can take the HA port and assign it to uh, this and that agent. Uh, and finally, we can create the router L3 agent point, router L3 agent binding, which actually represents a binding. So an example race condition is this. So the starting point is that we have some kind of an old router. It is an HA router. And user 2 likes to delete it because it doesn't want it anymore. And user 1 wants to create a new router, also an HA router. So this is the scheduling that is done by the um, CPU scheduler of the uh, computer, uh, of the machine, or multiple machines, uh, whatever. This is the timing that, ha that happens. So first of all, the user 2 flow uh, deletes the router. It, wanted to delete the router, go ahead. We don't need it on the database anymore. And next up, we say, okay, so this is basically the last HA router. We don't need the HA network anymore. The tenant doesn't have any more HA routers. So let's delete the HA network. So we have made a decision. Let's delete the HA network. This isn't committed until later, as can be seen by this uh, dotted line. Uh, and then the uh, CPU scheduler says, okay, let's give user one some runtime. So we create the new router, the um, router we just wanted to create. And then we, the next step is checking if an HA network exists. And if it doesn't exist, we can create it. But if it already exists, we don't need to create it. So in this case, the deletion of the HA network wasn't committed yet. So it's still there. So we don't need to create it. Um, the workflow then continues into committing the actual deletion of uh, the HA network. And then once we try to create the HA port for the uh, HA network, for the specific HA network that we detected here, we are yelling because we don't have an HA network. So the HA network has deleted 
from under us. So this is an example race condition. There are a few others. Uh, I'll let Kevin uh, go through them, okay. or a few well, of them. So the, the obvious question that comes up here when you have these big complex operations is why can't we just put this all inside of a database transaction? So we start a transaction, create an HA network, create all the L3 HA ports, depending on the number of L3 agents you have set up for HA. Um, create the tenant to HA network binding, then call commit on the database. And if there's any issues, any duplicate entries, that kind of stuff, uh, you just have one exception that you need to handle and you can start the whole process over. So that would be problem solved. The issue comes when you look at the internals of how neutron resources work. We have networks and ports and routers, and these are all distinct resources that have separate transactional semantics in their creation and they can correspond to external resources on other systems. So if we put everything inside of one giant database transaction and we go through create a port, create a network, create a router, and then encounter an exception, the database will roll back, but if we've been communicating with external systems, we'll leave a bunch of orphan resources on these external systems. Uh, this example right here of just creating a, a network and a port shows that there can be up to just even three different external systems with just even one ML2 backend configured. Uh, creating a network needs to talk to the Neutron database, uh, then go off to the ML2 backend, then come into create port. We allocate an IP from an external IP allocation management system, go back to the database uh, here, and then go off to the ML2 backend when it comes time to bind the port, and then go back to the Neutron database. So these are all s separate transactions that we can't roll up into one giant database transaction. Otherwise, we leave a bunch of stuff left over in ML2 backends or external IP allocation systems. So the next question that comes up is, well, can we use locks? This would be an easy solution. Just put a giant lock around whenever we have uh, a router operation to make sure we don't have a delete happening at the same time as a create when it comes to HA networks for a tenant. So there's threads and file locks, DB locks, and then distributed lock manager, two is in this case that we looked at, and I'll talk about each one. So thread locks and file locks are just based on exclusive access um, that a process has inside of a server. So it's either some internal process exclusive resource like a thread mutex or a file open for exclusive access on the file system. But this only can prevent concurrent calls within scope of a single Neutron server. And Neutron supports running a whole bunch of Neutron servers all in active mode. So you have a load balancer sending requests across a bunch of servers. Thread locks and file locks won't do anything to help you because it's only protecting an individual server. So then you can do kind of a fake lock with the database. You can use transaction level locks, which would be OK for a single transaction, but in this case, we're doing multiple transactions, so uh, select for update doesn't work because that's scoped to a specific transaction. Once you commit, that lock is released. And on top of that, if we try to use like a separate side transaction to hold a lock for the entire time of other concurrent transactions, this falls apart when you're using multi-writer Galera clusters. So if you're doing HA availability for your MySQL backend, then this doesn't block concurrent lock access. It throws an exception at the end, at which point it's too late and it didn't actually protect you from concurrent access. Uh, the other option is just a basic reservation table where you insert a record into the database that says, hey, I'm doing an operation for this tenant and then it has a unique constraint and then nobody else is allowed to insert a record uh, while they see it there. But then the problem you have there is you have to deal with stale records. If a, if a server acquired a lock by inserting a record and then died, all the other servers will just sit there waiting for that other server to get rid of it. So you have to come up with some kind of, uh, kind of hack together timeout mechanism to decide, well, maybe after 30 seconds, maybe it died and I'll just try to take the lock anyway. But it's not really a good locking mechanism. So that brings us to uh, using a distributed lock manager, which is designed to solve this problem. And there's twos, which is part of the uh, OpenStack Big Tent. That's a library provides distributed coordination primitives. So it has leader elections, grouping, and most importantly for our use case, locking. Um, and then it has this driver architecture to use different backends to where uh, it stores the locks or the, these coordination primitives. It can work with Zookeeper, Redis, Memcache. Um, there's several other backends that you can find on, their, on the site for it. And this would solve the problem that we're running into here 
but it has uh, a couple of downsides. The, the first one is there's a constant overhead now of lock acquisition across multiple servers. So whenever we want to do a router operation on the Neutron server, we now have to talk to Twos, which uses a driver to contact a, another server or another service. And if it's in an HA availability mode, then they have to go through some kind of election algorithm to acquire a lock across the Twos backend. Um, this isn't a huge deal. We could maybe uh, deal with that because this isn't something that happens very frequently, tenant creating and deleting routers. But the, the big downside we ran into is this would be a new operator dependency um, requirement for the twos backend. Right now, or when we were originally looking at this, there weren't any OpenStack core projects that had shipped twos as a requirement yet, so we didn't want to be the first one to force the adoption of twos on all the operators. Uh, there's a emailing list thread here where you can see the discussion about deciding whether or not to use the uh, twos for the distributed lock manager. Uh, so the solutions we come up with uh, for the race conditions are, you know, use the database as much as possible, um, model, model constraints, uh, model things as unique constraints whenever possible. So L3 agent plus router ID, there should only be one binding of a router to a single agent. It doesn't make sense for an agent to host the same router multiple times. That was one, one example. Um, utilize transactional guarantees offered by the database where we can. If it's not a multi-transaction thing, we can look up to see if there's a binding there. If there's not a binding there, then we can safely try to create one, uh, commit, and then catch any exceptions that are based on stale data or DB duplicate entry if there is a race condition from uh, another writer. And then wrap this stuff up in retry loops. So oh, I hit some kind of transient error, start over, try again. There'll either already be something there and we have a code path to return early, or the other thing uh, encountered another error and we can safely create again. So the approach just broadly looks like this. We say, does the resource and the binding for it already exist? For example, the HA network. Does the HA network, uh, is there a binding for HA network? Does it exist? Use it. So that's easy. That's the first return. If it doesn't exist, then we go on and we create the resource and try to create the binding, which has a unique constraint for the tenant. If we hit a duplicate error, it means somebody else already beat us to it. There's already a, now a tenant network for, um, uh, already an HA network for that tenant. So now we delete the resource and then trigger retry, at which point we just go right back up to the, uh, this start thing and we'll hit this early exit of use it. Um, same thing with the, with the binding. If we think the resource exists, we'll try to create the unique constraint. If we get a DB reference error, it means somebody deleted the network out from under us. So we just loop back and start over at the create resource phase there. So this essentially solved the problem. It's kind of a complex state machine that it goes through, but it'll retry up to 10 times, and this effectively solved the issue of racing with uh, the tenant HA network management. Uh, one of the other issues we had is the L3 agent would periodically call the server to sync all the routers that are running on it, and it would catch an HA router right after the database object for it had been created, but it would be missing important things for the HA stuff like the HA network or the L3 agent HA interfaces because it was still being built on the server side. Uh, so we decided to use the status field to flag partially formed routers so the agent could say, hey, this one's still being built, just skip over it and then uh, get it on the next sync. Uh, the existing values we had in the status didn't map really well to this intermediary state of the server is still in the process of building this resource because it's kind of a composite resource of different individual resources. So we added a new status field called allocating. So now when you first, first create a HA router, you'll see an allocating state. And then the L3 agent won't receive any routers that are stuck in this allocating state. Um, then once the server is done setting up the HA network, all the L3 HA ports, that kind of stuff, it'll flip it to the um, active state and then the agent can get it. Um, there's, there's a downside to this approach is if a server dies or encounters an error while the router's in the allocating state, we can end up with a router that's stuck in the allocating state and it won't get scheduled to an agent. And there's uh, a fix for that that just recently emerged that John will talk about later. So what was fixed in Mataka, we fixed most of these server-side races with API requests. So if you're running rally tests that's hammering the server with lots of create, delete, uh, um, HA, or yeah, create, delete HA routers, um, most of those issues have been solved in Mataka. 
a lot of them were back, well, a lot of them were back part of the Liberty too, yeah. right? So, um, and then races triggered by concurrent agent operations, the agent syncing to the server at the same time um, and crashing when it would get a HA router that was halfway being formed. So those have all been fixed in Mitaka as well. So now I'll let Ann talk about testing for this. Okay, so um, when we uh, found out these um, uh, errors uh, that John and Kevin described, uh, we decided that we need to find out how they look like in production-like environment. So we ran some tests uh, on the uh, scale labs for Liberty and Mitaka. Uh, these uh, results are published in performance docs. Uh, the links will be at the end of the presentation. And here I will share the most important results from there. So our, our testing was performed on the lab uh, that consists of three controllers, 45 compute nodes. Uh, service hardware of each node is presented on this slide. And uh, what was actually tested? Uh, here we speak about races, but um, other aspects of 3HA was also checked. Um, so at first we check races. The best tool to bring out as much races as possible is Rally. Rally is a benchmarking tool for OpenStack that allows us to create huge amount of resources concurrently. Um, another uh, thing that uh, is a 3HA is actually about low for lower time. So we want to check and to verify how um, a reboot to the node, for example, impacts on connectivity for a VM or a pair of VMs. So manual tests can help to measure this. And to see how um, restart of three agent or stop impacts on connectivity for large number of VMs were used shaker tests. Shaker is a distributed data plane testing tool for OpenStack. I want to highlight here that um, stop or restart all three agent won't cause connection interruption until crowd namespaces aren't cleaned up as well. So at first let me share Liberty testing results that we get on the environment uh, which was deployed uh, with uh, Mirage OpenStack 8.0. So uh, at first let's talk about rally tests. Uh, Rally uh, gives us um, an ability to test uh, OpenStack, uh, an ability of OpenStack to perform simple operations like create, delete, create, update, create list. Uh, for us, the most important test was create and delete routers. Uh, and here uh, on this slide, there is an example of um, uh, create and delete routers YAML. Um, so um, this scenario creates a network given number of subnets and routers and delete all the routers. Uh, this scenario has uh, uh, times and concurrency parameters. Times means how many times this scenario will be executed and concurrency allows us to execute current um, scenario in, with given number of concurrent threads. So uh, to get um, as much race conditions uh, with deletion and creation of HA routers, HA networks, and HA interfaces, uh, we uh, run these tests um, with um, different times and concurrency parameters. Um, L3HA uh, has a restriction uh, of uh, 255 HA ports per HA network per tenant. And if number of VIPs exceeded this limit, our uh, new chain network uh, is not created. So uh, we have some um, tests that uh, were failed due to misconfiguration. Uh, this is shown in yellow bars because uh, the number of tenants wasn't enough uh, for the number of routers that were going to be created. So um, with um, increased number of tenants, this test passed without any errors. Uh, here are some more numbers of uh, issues uh, that we faced in. So subnet in use error is about the race uh, with the chain network management. Uh, and session rollback is an error be uh, because of the race between uh, the agent full sync and uh, creation of a chain router. Uh, so um, now let's take a look on the data plane side of 3 chain. 
So the idea of uh, manual tests is very simple. Uh, at first, we boot a VM or a pair of VMs. Then we perform some destructive act. Uh, then we start connectivity check, and then we perform some destructive action uh, and check uh, the packet loss. Then we perform this test again with increased number of road tests. Uh, the number of road tests are increased from test to test to uh, increase uh, the load for L3 agents. So the most important for manual test is spin to external network from the M during a uh, reset of uh, controller with active L3 agent. Uh, so on the left there is a network scheme for this test and uh, on the right uh, there is a graph uh, of dependency a number of routers uh, from a number of packet loss. So uh, there was instability of rescheduling time for 175 routers. Uh, the problem with this issue that it wasn't reproduced uh, on their virtual environments at all. So now let's take a look how things are going with large number of DMs. And at first let me describe how Shaker works. Shaker um, deployed uh, instances on different compute nodes and uh, execute a connection t uh, connectivity check between them. Uh, Shaker contains server and agent modules. Uh, server is responsible for deploying of instances, uh, execution of tests, processing results and report generation. Agent uh, are lightweight and they run inside of the EMS and pull tasks from server and replies with results. Uh, the um, topology deployed uh, using heat blade. Once um, um, we can see that there is uh, agent in slave mode and in master mode. In slave mode, uh, this means that these agents are used as a backend for corresponding commands. For example, they run IPERF in the server mode. So once all the agent are replies to server, the test execution is considered to be finished and um, if some of the agent didn't make it in dedicated time, such results marked as lost. Uh, I will uh, share uh, the uh, basic uh, scenarios of Shaker and full, uh, scenario, uh, full different scenarios can be found in performance docs. So uh, L3 East-West tests um, test the bandwidth between them that located in different networks but plugged into the same router. Uh, the test started from one pair of themes on different compute nodes and increased load until all available compute nodes are used. Um, during execution of shaker tests, uh, I ran scripts that um, stop uh, an active L3 agent and clean up routing namespaces. Then when another L3 agent become active, uh, the first L3 agent was started. So on the graph on the left we can see upload and unload uh, bandwidth of with and without restart of L3 agent. The same test was performed for ordinary rotary scheduling, uh, L3HA was turned off. And on the table on the right there is a table um, how many IPF runs were ended uh, with errors or lost. And we can see that for ordinary rotary scheduling a lot of results were lost or ended with errors. Uh, L3 no South tests check the bandwidth between the AMs that um, are located in different networks. Uh, the uh, instances with um, master agent are located in one network and uh, instances with slave agent are reached there via floating IPs. And the same, it started from one pair of them until all um, available compute nodes are used. And the, set, and the testing was performed in the same way and uh, we actually get uh, the similar results. So this test shows us the benefits of for L3HA in comparison with ordinary rotary shuttling. So, and now let's take a look for Mitaka testing results, uh, which we get on environment um, based on um, branches open stack uh, uh, 9.0. Um, so the rally tests um, uh, were run in the same way and actually have the same as configuration at first. Uh, and um, here are some more numbers. Uh, we can see that our errors uh, subnet and use still persist, 
but we uh, fix other errors, but we got new error, the server didn't respond in time uh, for creating delete and creating update, and we suspect that actually this happened because of allocating or uh, change. Pin to external network from the M during reset of controller uh, help us to catch and investigate bug to masters of the reboot of controller. Uh, and uh, on the uh, left there, there is the same network scheme and the graph uh, with dependency. So actually this um, uh, problem was happened due um, with this problem was fixed during Newton and on the right uh, we can see that during reboot of the node a lot of packets were lost. So um, here are uh, the shaker tests, which also was performed uh, with and without a restart for 3 j uh, and uh, we got uh, the similar results for L3 east-west and L3 north-south. Uh, so summarizing Metaco results, we see that although some uh, things were fixed, uh, we um, have new issues, and now John will describe us how we managed to fix them. Thank you. Um, so during the, uh, the testing undid, we found a specific bug. Uh, this is the bug number you can see. Uh, so basically after the uh, rebooting of a controller, there were two uh, master nodes. We fixed that. We fixed other uh, bugs as well that all uh, can be divided into the three main types of uh, races that Kevin talked about uh, that involved um, uh, concurrent API requests, uh, create and delete a router concurrently, or sending uh, incomplete or partial data uh, into the L3 agent, or the L3 agent um, issuing some kind of a request that will eventually cause problems in the scheduler like uh, we saw before. A timeline of the bugs and the uh, uh, patches that fixed uh, most of them uh, can be found in the Etherpad. Um, and very close to the end of uh, Newton, at the uh, mid-cycle in Ireland, um, uh, we sat down and we figured out that we can add a binding index to the router L3 agent binding. So basically, uh, now every time we create a router L3 agent binding, the object that matches a router to a single agent, we also add a, a binding index, which is a unique field uh, for each router, which means that basically when I create uh, a binding for uh, some router to some agent, I, can, I need to use some kind of a binding index, which means that if two, um, two different uh, workers or two different schedulers are trying to create the same entry using the same binding index, uh, this will fail because uh, the binding index is unique. Uh, in the non-HA, we only allow binding index uh, with the value of one, and in the HA case, uh, we use different uh, binding index between one and the maximum number of uh, L3 agents that we will uh, assign to, uh, that we will schedule to, and this basically prevents overscheduling an HA router um, that, um, that might happen, uh, and concurrent scheduling because now in case uh, two schedulers try to bind uh, an HA router to uh, two different agents, they will both use binding index equals one, and that will fail. Uh, and this allows the removal of the allocating uh, status. So basically, um, we are going to, uh, looking forward, what we are uh, about to do is we are going to refactor the L3 scheduler to allow us to first create the router L3 agent binding, change the ordering such that instead of creating all the HA resources and then creating the router L3 agent binding, we can first create the router L3 agent binding, uh, which is now considered safe. Uh, and then after we know that the assignment was, um, was successful, we can continue on to create all the other HA routers uh, uh, resources. And this will allow us to remove the allocating status because we, don't know, we no longer need it uh, because now everything is apparently safe. Uh, and even, forward, even further uh, in the future, we are planning to use uh, a push notification which will simplify um, the communication between the server uh, and the agent even more. Uh, so one thing we want to emphasize is that the current code is safe to use. Uh, these are looking forward, these are improvements to the code, not uh, bug fixes. So please use layer 3 HA. Uh, it's awesome. Um, some links, uh, the links uh, for Anne's uh, um, uh, benchmarks and scale tests can be found here. And uh, we have time for a few questions.
If you go back to the links page, so if they want to take a picture of it, yeah. If you want to take uh, pictures and questions. Any questions, somebody? So did you guys ever stop for a moment to think the solution is way too complex? Do we, do, do we solve this problem differently? I mean, what you're trying to do is you're trying to get packets from one compute node to another. Right? There is no routing in the way we know where they are to begin with. And you're saying, well, I will not add any intelligence at the node to know where to send the, the packets. I'll add a, another node that will do routing. Well, right? Then I bottleneck it. I have a point of failure, so I need to start scaling it. So I need HA solutions. And now you're saying we have races even in, a, in the API. Right? So when do you stop and say, is this the right solution? Right, so the sending traffic between two compute nodes, the DVR plus, this is mainly now to handle the source NAT case, where everybody wants to share a single IP address for a whole tenant's worth of traffic, and we need to coordinate the use of that address. So your testing was east-west, um, yeah, that, that NAT is just north-south. Right? right, right, but if, if you want, you can skip the HA for east-west by using DVR yep. plus HA. Okay, so then, but then just SNAT, this is just for SNAT? Then, then in that case, as it would just be SNAT for the L3HA. Okay. But it is, yeah, it's a, a, a valid question. We kind of go through a lot of work to make this single source NAT IP address usable uh, across a whole bunch of locations by putting it on the ne uh, network node, and then we have to make it highly available. But this is, people are concerned about IPv4 usage, so it's a difficult problem to overcome. Oh, oh hey, we'll let Chris go first. Um, oh, as someone who actually ran into the, the, um, the uh, multiple actives on, uh, after a reboot, uh, one thing that I saw was that um, is there the the option to do a policy uh, or some other mechanism to actually verify there's a, a stat there's a configuration that isn't a valid one such as multiple actives. Um, well, do you remember what the the um, bug fix was for that? Yeah, yeah actually, the, the bug fix. This uh, we started using port status. We check the port for three G. The bug that was uh, with two masters. The problem is that um, the L two agent uh, started um, later than L three agent. So the H A port wasn't um, active, and when uh, the uh, the problem actually, uh, so when L3 agent started rescheduling router, he thinks that the J-board was okay, but it wasn't. So we start using, uh, start checking uh, there if a J-board is active. So now actually this problem shouldn't be there. But uh, we did in Newton and I think we ported it in Mitak even somehow. So in Mitak and uh, later it should be fixed. Yeah, and we're also working on uh, Liberty, I think, and uh, backporting it to Liberty as well. Yeah, but actually at this moment there are some problems, so it's, we're working it's questionable. On Liberty. <laughs> uh, I know my question. Oh, I, hang on, he was, he was next. <laughs> uh, any plans for backporting all these bugs to Mitaka Liberty? So quite a few have been backported to Mitaka. I think Liberty's hit a point now, though, where it's a lot of security, like critical only fixes. Um, so I'm not sure how many of them will be able to get back all the way to Liberty now. Yeah, we're trying to uh, backport as many patches as we can and, 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 and as many uh, fixes. But some of the uh, fixes depend on some database uh, changes, which can't be, boxed, can't be backported because uh, database changes. Um, we're actually out of time, I think. Or maybe just one more. Yeah. It's quick, maybe. <laughs> we'll see. Um, my question, I've 
two questions, but um, they're related. Uh, one of them is, have you tried to, you think you hope your threat safe, is it, um, have you proved the algorithm and you're just worried about the code? Or have you just, because uh, have you proved your algorithm's threat safe? That's my question. So, well, so there's no, um, it, it's not multi-threading, it's eventlet coroutine based yeah. switching inside of Python. There's no shared data structures between coroutines, so we don't have to worry about concurrent um, access to the same data structure, it's about coordinating around the, the database. And so it's just, just through testing, right? Is, is, Okay. There's not like a formal proof of it, but it's and, it's... and what do you do when you add a new, now you add a new API call that might interfere? Do you test it? Is, is there a way for you to check when someone push, pushes code instead of just running it? Just when you're thinking about new APIs, how do you know that they're not going to interrupt? It's very ad, very ad hoc. It just requires testing, see if it breaks stuff, and then just knowledge of the database and knowing what's a distinct unit and if it's, if it's a composite. This is one of the rare like, resources in Neutron that's made up of other sub-resources. So it's not a very common problem. Normally we can wrap everything up in a single transaction and be good I to go. I will just add here mm -hmm. that actually we try, I'm trying to check all the changes that we got uh, on L3HA on the virtual environment with several nodes at least. So ran some rally tests and check that it doesn't get worse. So from the some point, I do it regularly, so. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.